Ah, jeez. Ah, oh, jeez. So last night we got another look at the Fargo on the FX network. Another week, another episode. Oof. Another body in a trunk. Yeah. <laughs> so um, let's talk normal for a little bit. Yeah. Um, this episode was a little bit slower in pace. I did find myself uh, not quite as hyped up. I didn't do any gasping. I did do a lot of little chuckling here and there, but it was much more subdued than the the four body. First episode. Which, which really all happened in the course of uh, 45 Probably. minutes. Yeah, you know, if that. So, yeah. And I think a lot of people will be kind of thrown for that with this second episode because it's more to, now that now that certain scenes are set, how do you further those along without just ratcheting it up? And how do you, how can you keep that up? So I think they did a pretty smart job with that this time around. Yeah. Well, so we got to, we got introduced to the first uh, characters from Fargo. I don't know if I believe those. They're from Fargo. They, they were poor, poor, uh, yeah. The, big the, city guys, huh? Big city guys. <laughs> the tall mute guy with the with the Jerry with the and Jerry then, Spence uh, <laughs> jacket, you know, fringe, fringe Who jacket. only speaks in, like, gibberish sign language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally not, what is that? Uh, like, not ASL. Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> not at all. Um, and Adam Goldberg, awesome to see him back. Yeah, it was. Except I do not buy him as no. somebody from Fargo at all. They're supposed to be the big mobsters they could coming be in from, from the big city, Fargo, like driving in from Fargo, but not necessarily like no. born in. It's like they not. flew in, landed at Hector, and then went to Bemidji, Fargo. Right. And like, okay, so those are the mob guys. Those are the heavyweights. Like those guys stick out so easily, even yeah. more so than Lorne Malvo. Yeah. Um, which, by the way, I liked Lorne Malvo, Billy Bob Thornton's character on the show last week. This week, I greatest character in TV. Do you hard him? I don't hard him as you're gonna in, say I'm that you're gonna say that you are such a big, 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 big uh, Breaking Bad fan. You like him more than the characters on Breaking Bad. Well, no, but he's one t- one of the greatest. One of the, okay, one of the greatest TV characters so far. I just I love him. I, lo- I he went to the post office and he asked for the name and he's like. Duluth. Duluth. And it, just like the way he delivers lines is awesome. It, it is it is a great job, and, and Billy Bob Thornton's doing a great job with it. It's a really well-written character because he doesn't necessarily always say a lot. As you discover later in one crucial scene, he doesn't say anything. He just drops trow and sits on the toilet. <laughs> I know. With the door yeah. open. Uh-huh. That was a, an awkward moment, especially for Midwesterners <laughs> because, like, anything – having to do with anything that happens in a bathroom. And then when you hear that sound and you understand exactly what happened, I think that was a first for broadcast TV. Yeah. And then the pee jar after that. Yeah. An ace and a deuce. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's talk about Bob Erd- Odenkirk's Odenkirk. uh, character on this. I He was the one that had me cracking up last night because he plays such a doofus. It, and like his character with the female um, sheriff or I guess it's a cop, Bemidji yeah, officer, cop, yep. um, they, they just do such a good job of playing a Midwest good cop, bad cop because they're both exceedingly polite, but one of them is supposed to be the the nice one. One of them has a clue. Yeah, exactly. And the other one, Bob Odenkirk, doesn't. What was his line about Lester and the... Uh, she girl? had her monthly. <laughs> she had her monthly. Yeah, that was another... I I felt for women in this episode again. Women are still being portrayed as kind of ding I'm going to disagree with you on there uh, because the... Well, to degree... I just used the word ding-a-ling. ding <laughs> But uh, the the, uh, the officer Molly, mm-hmm. uh, she's you could see the wheels are turning there. She's figuring things out. She knows the way to go. But then also the uh, the slain officer, the cop's wife, you know, she stands up behind Molly when they're in the kitchen. She yeah. says, "I'm not saying you're not wrong, but sometimes you have to." And I think that that was kind of a good thing too. Was you, that a quadruple negative? It was a super. It was a super Midwestern way to say you're wrong. But I thought that was I thought that was a great scene too because that showed that there's a character with a little bit of backbone. In in the first episode, she was all over the place trying to figure out how to paint the child's room. Um, I, I really liked that part, and we are introduced to to the supermarket king of Minnesota, but then also his wife, who is uh, just a, a bubblehead, bad out of hell, bad out of hell, and 
with the crazy sun. Oliver Platt also is um, seemingly the only person in the Midwest that actually swears. <laughs> you know, I think I beat up on the show last week because I was like, we don't just say gosh darn it and right. OGs and stuff all the time. And he actually was dropping some. And FX will push the language barrier, and they haven't really so far this year. This no. this time in, in, in this one, they are. Uh, yeah, Oliver Platt's character is a kind of what uh, Eastern European descent uh, grocery store king. Uh, this is, I think, this is another good character. This will be fun yeah. to see him play out. He's being threatened with blackmail. Uh, not really sure where it's coming from. He has a hunch. He gets Lauren Malville on the case. Lauren. Lauren's getting to the bottom of this. Yeah, he is. And how much did you love that ransom note? That was like a seventh <laughs> grader made it out of 17 magazines. And what does he say? Well, I think Lauren Melville, when he's looking at it, is like, this is an awfully specific number. <laughs> I think it doesn't go down to the cents, too. Yes. It was pretty great. Yeah, so um, we didn't get our, you know, we've been doing the body count because that's as gruesome as it gets. And last last week we had four. This week we only had one. And only. it came it came right at the end. And it was, you know, a patron of the Lucky Penny. Yep. Is that what it's called? Lucky Penny? Uh, I can't remember. I think it is. The Lucky Penny strip bar in Bemidji. And um, he gets... Which people, people from Bemidji want you to know they don't have a strip bar. No. People are very excited about that. Yes. And not in a good way. No. Um, but so the the crime syndicate out of Fargo comes and takes care of Lenny. Every town has a Lenny. Because they think that he is their guy that they're looking for. He's not. Yeah, didn't kill. And uh, and again, you know, they they have a uh, an interesting way of disposing of the body, with the uh, augering out the ice wall and dropping him into the lake. Yeah, I do I do like that they are coming up with very midwestern ways of killing people. Yeah, although you know it's uh they I don't know why you would do that in the middle of the day. No. No. I suppose not, huh? <laughs> two, two shows in, two bodies in the trunks. I think, uh, I don't think this is out what Audi signed up for when they signed up for sponsorship. <laughs> mm, probably our, not. our trunks are spacious enough to store a body. <laughs> um, one character we have not talked about and we probably should is Lester, the main character Lester played Nygaard, by um, Martin, Freeman. Martin Freeman. And, you know, if you couldn't love Lester anymore after the last one, even though he killed his wife, he brutally murdered his wife with a hammer to the head, I still loved him. And then this episode, early in, he goes in her room and he lifts up her sweater and he smells it and he breaks down and starts crying. And I I get that he killed his wife, but there's just something so darn lovable he about is him. Kinda, I'm not sure about lovable, but he is very sympathetic because he is such a smaller man who's being picked on and just rolled over yeah. by, by bigger forces, including Officer Molly, who's got an eye for him as a person of interest in this yeah. investigation. He pulled a lot of the old um, William H. Macy, Jerry Lundegaard, fumbling, bumbling alibi yeah. stuff out in this one. And, and I, I think we're going to see more of that, uh, really. With, yeah. I agree. So, The one thing, Colin Hanks. We saw more about Colin Hanks' character, Gus Grimley, the Duluth cop who pulled over Lorne Malvo in the first episode, now realizes that maybe what he was getting into, he was maybe, was he right by letting him go? Did he do the right thing by the rest of the world by, by letting his own. him go? Yeah, and I thought that was a really philosophical kind of conversation he had with his young daughter at the, at the dinner table in their plaid. Yeah, uh, in their flannels. Yeah, eating chicken nuggets. As, as he, they look over across the way to his kind of voyeuristic neighbor. Yeah. I didn't know that Duluth had that many apartments like that. That seemed very they New York. They can, actually. Duluth's a pretty, was a, you know, because of the, the shipping industry there in the in the 1900s, there was a pretty big... History lesson from yep. John Lamb. Right I, was, I went to school in Duluth, 1989, so right. I know a little bit about it. I, I can believe that. I can believe that scene. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hot neighbor. Hot neighbor. The whole family living in an apartment, though. I don't, I don't know. know Not that. Duluth to Not me. Not Duluth. Um, but, yeah, I think we are getting established in, you know, what's going to be happening in Bemidji, what's going to be happening in Duluth, what's going to be coming out of Fargo. And so it'll just be cu uh, curious to see what they do with these characters in the third episode. Third episode. Who dies? I don't know. Interesting. <laughs>